technical difficulties. Merci, Gerard. Um, <clears throat> I'm faced with two challenges. I've, I've um, got to discuss a topic in 20 minutes that would normally take uh, about as many hours as there are words in my title. Um, and also, after a very delicious and <laughs> very filling lunch, I have to try to keep you awake. Um, so thank you very much for coming, and uh, thank you for uh, the organizers for um, organizing the event as well. Um, my, my topic is going to take off on, on, on what uh, Gerard was talking about with respect to life after death. So I'm, I'm trying to focus on what the life is, how we're going to give the life to that uh, patent. Um, <clears throat> clearly, everyone in this room are experts. There's nothing I can teach you more than what you already know. So I'm going to just give you a few um, uh, perhaps strategies or recommendations that, that uh, you probably already are aware of, but uh, hopefully um, you'll take something away. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, as, as we all know, pharmaceutical applications, like uh, software applications as well, arguably, have a number of unique issues. We have typically a large number of claims that we have to deal with, different types of claims, limitations on the subject matter based on jurisdiction, and uh, disclosure requirements that also vary by jurisdiction. Um, the, the theme I want to convey here is, is to plan ahead and plan carefully. You, you almost have to have this crystal ball uh, to focus on what you're going to protect years down the road. But that has to be done at your initial priority filing date. So with that in mind, um, let me first start with claim structure. Um, as we know, pharmaceutical inventions can be claimed in a number of different ways. Uh, products, processes, methods of treatment, if, if you're in the U.S., uh, uh, Canada, Europe, and India, of course, that's not permitted, as we heard earlier today as well with respect to India. Diagnostic methods are also challenged. Uh, use of the product, uh, secondary use, as we, as we can do in Canada and Europe, uh, versus Swiss-type claims for use in medicaments, compositions, dosage forms, etc. The strategy, the recommendation, I should say, for, for my side, include as many types of claims as you can. Um, earlier on in the, in the morning today, it's an economic reality, um, and the one option there, one uh, recommendation is to consolidate wherever possible. Uh, multiple dependencies, uh, consolidation in the European system, for example, with alternative wording, preferred wording. Um, in the U.S., of course, we, we have the issue of uh, the multiple dependencies being uh, uh, taxed very heavily. Uh, the fees, of course, are going up, as you may have heard, uh, in about another six weeks or so. So uh, that may not necessarily be possible. Um, Markush groupings, again, they're very commonly used. I, uh, I caution against that. In, in Canada, we have we have some law that, that uh, speaks to the, in, the validity of a Marcush group failing if even one member is found to have a lot or lack utility. So I quite often recommend converting a Marcush group into alternative wording instead. Um, again, continuing with the strategy, this again is very well known to everybody here, but you have to ensure that your patent is granted with at least one claim that allows the patent to be included on a patent register, as we say in Canada, or an orange book, as they say in the U.S. Um, so the claim, according to the Canadian regulations, Canadian, the claim has to be directed to the medicinal ingredient, a formulation containing the ingredient, a dosage form of the ingredient, or its use. So intermediates, metabolites, et cetera, those kind of claims are not, uh, patents contain those kind of claims are not able to be registered, uh, included in the register, I should say. The other issue is in Canada, in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, our regulations uh, were amended, our, uh, the, the regulations governing the uh, notice of compliance for the registration of the patent. Uh, and essentially, the regulation now requires the claims to specifically match the, uh, the, the description of the, uh, the drug that's in, in the new drug submission. So these are just two examples that I've given here that are unfortunately drastic in consequence. Uh, the first is the Gilead case. So this is a, uh, uh, an HIV treatment and a formulation which uh, the patent claimed a, a combination of two components, uh, A and B, and in a, a dependent claim, there was an, a, uh, an optional component, C, but it was described in, as in the form of a class. C itself was not specifically claimed. The drugs, new drug submission, however, specifically claimed A, B, and C. And that patent was deemed ineligible for registration on inclusion on the, inclusion on the patent register. A similar uh, consequence occurred here in the Purdue case, where this was a controlled release um, uh, analgesic uh, tablet uh, containing oxycodone. <clears throat> that was the patent. The NDS, 
however, claimed oxycodone with another medicinal ingredient. Again, the patent, because it didn't claim that specific combination, was, not, was ineligible for inclusion on the list. Now let me jump to unity of invention. <clears throat> Again, I'll be very quick on this one because we're all familiar with the issues. Again, a patent can only be granted for one invention. Uh, now the criteria, of course, as you all know, I'm sure by experience, does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, in some countries, uh, like Canada and the U.S., we're, we're very fortunate that uh, um, if, in the case of a unity of invention issue, the examiner will issue a uh, restriction requirement, and we're able then to choose, uh, the applicant is entitled to choose which invention they want to pursue in, in the patent application. Other, the other inventions can be pursued in divisional applications as, as, as needed. In other jurisdictions, like, for example, in PCT in Europe, if a unity issue is faced, the examiners look at the first invention recited in the claims. Um, especially in the PCT case, uh, unfortunately, the only way to, at the search level, the only way to deal with that issue is to pay the additional search fees if you want second or third inventions to be searched as well. So it does get exp potentially expensive. So the strategy here, again, is anticipate these unity uh, rejections. And what I try to recommend to clients is, is if you have a preferred invention uh, that is included in the claims, try to recite that first. So when it gets to jurisdictions like PCT or Europe, that invention, your preferred invention, is reviewed first. Uh, as I mentioned, in, in uh, uh, Europe, we have this two-year problem for divisionals. So even though we have the right to file divisionals, we have the issue with respect to this two-year problem, as I put in quotes. In Canada, we have uh, another, uh, another problem with respect to obviousness-type double patenting. Uh, this prohibition is also existing in the U.S., but unlike the U.S., we don't have a terminal disclaimer practice. So if you have a divisional application that is directed to an obvious invention over the parent case, the divisional patent, once issued, potentially could be uh, invalidated as being obvious. Um, the way to get around that uh, is to essentially draw a restriction requirement from an examiner, and that essentially insulates you from that type of attack. Um, so for that reason, the advice, of course, is to put all your claims in, present them to the examiner, draw the restriction requirement, and you're free from the obviousness type issue. Um, I added India in here in the, uh, in the first day of the, of the seminar. I added this slide, actually, this, this one line. Uh, there was a speaker that had mentioned that in India, there's apparently, again, an issue with respect to divisional applications being revoked for obviousness, uh, obviousness issues. It's, it's, that's news to me, so I'm going to put it in just as another warning. Uh, utility. Now, this is, this is a bit of an issue here in Canada, and I'm sure you've heard um, uh, the, some of the cases that have occurred recently in the last few years. Again, as we all know, claimed invention must have utility. <clears throat> um, so in Canada, uh, using our regulations, um, the utility of invention must be, as of the filing date, either demonstrated or reasonably predictable. Uh, the demonstration of utility does not require the data to be presented in the specification. You can refer to it in past tense, for example, and that's fine. Or if it's ever challenged, you, as long as you can present the, uh, the evidence of the, of the demonstrated utility, you're again fine. The issue comes, though, when you get to the reasonable prediction issue, when you want to broaden that scope. Under our law, <clears throat> under the Supreme Court decision that we have from a few years back, in order to substantiate a reasonable prediction, there has to be a factual basis for making the prediction and then a, uh, a sound line of reasoning extending the, the factual basis to the predicted utility of the, of the entire scope of the claim. The part three of that test is both of those factors must be contained in the specification. So post-filing data is not allowed, and you can't go back after the fact and say, well, here's, this is my factual basis, uh, or this is the, the line of reasoning that I used. So the the takeaway here, my, my recommended strategy here, is to tell the story, explain in very, very simple terms from start to finish how the invention was arrived at. If you do that, in most cases, you'll be, you'll be taking care of your reasonable prediction requirement under, under our law. Uh, and, and again, I mentioned here, include the data wherever possible. Even though your demonstrated utility does not require data to be included, it's still a very strong recommendation to do so. I'm going to discuss the uh, very recent um, Supreme Court decision on the Viagra case, and that'll sort of hit home on that. Uh, disclosure requirements. <clears throat> Again, the invention has to be sufficiently and accurately disclosed to enable uh, a person skilled in the art to practice it. That, again, is very common in most jurisdictions. We heard 
uh, earlier today on the uh, on the requirement in India, and uh, uh, it's very similar to the way we have in Canada. The the way our courts approach it is it's a two-step, it's a two-part question. One is what is the invention and how does it work? It's very straightforward, but as you as you well know, answering these questions in detail in the specification is not necessarily easy all the time. Um, so. Uh, I mentioned the Viagra case. Let me just very, very quickly touch on this. You probably already are aware of it, but this is a Supreme Court decision from um, uh, just a few uh, uh, months back. Um, the, uh, the patent related to Viagra, sildenafil citrate, um, the specification disclosed a broad genus of something like four or 500 quintillion compounds. Um, the patent goes on to indicate that there were nine that were reviewed, and then it says, one, and I put that in quotes because it says one was found to be effective. It didn't identify sildenafil citrate, unfortunately, and there was no data presented. It was just, it was just a uh, commentary, one sentence commentary. Um, the claims recited the broad genus and as well as the two, two specific compounds, one of which was Viagra sildenafil citrate. The court interpreted the true invention, and I put that in quotes as well because I'll get to that in a minute, uh, to be sildenafil citrate, Viagra. So regardless of the fact that the, um, the broad genus was, uh, was shown, that's not good. Sorry, let me try that again. Okay, so regardless of the fact that the broad genus was claimed and the specific Viagra sildenafil citrate compound was also claimed, um, the, the patent was found to be, uh, uh, con the invention of the patent was found to be just the one uh, comp compound by itself. Because that compound was not disclosed in the specification, the, the patent was deemed void for lacking a sufficient disclosure. Now the interesting point here is Teva also attacked the utility, saying that the utility of specifically sildenafil citrate wasn't shown. The court tossed that argument out on the basis that because the utility was demonstrated, and as I mentioned before, demonstrated utility does not require disclosure in the specification. So the utility argument fell Unfortunately, the sufficiency of disclosure argument was, um, was found to be the nail in the coffin. Um, now, I mentioned the true invention or what's referred in our uh, body of laws developing in Canada as the promise of the invention. Um, the promise of the invention is, is a, it's a concept that started developing about five years ago or so in Canada but, but through our courts. And the whole point of it is review, reviewing the patent specification to identify what is the invention. What is the, what is the patentee claiming, or what what, what is the patentee invented? Now, once the, the promise of the invention is determined, then the utility and disclosure requirements are reviewed. So it's 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 done in a uh, top-down type of manner. So clearly, as you can uh, you can appreciate, if the promise is construed by the court to be something different than what you intended you have a problem because you may have framed your specification along one thought line and then the court says, no, no, that's not your invention. Your invention is this. Now show me where your disclosure is. So it's a, um, uh, it's a bit of a, a, a trap we have to be very careful of. And as I mentioned here, several uh, pharma patents have been invalidated for uh, uh, lacking either utility or disclosure based on how the promise was construed. So what's the strategy here? Um, this is, I'm repeating myself because you have to be very careful again, put all your information in. Um, and as I say here, define the promise of your invention very clearly. Um, don't leave it up to interpretation because it could be possibly interpreted incorrectly. So try to be as clear as possible in terms of what you're promising your invention to, to provide. And once you do that, then in the drafting phase in your specification, provide all the information that you need. So all the support for your disclosure requirements, the utility requirements, as I mentioned, if you're uh, basing the invention on a predicted utility, again, the factual basis, the, um, the line of reasoning, et cetera, explicitly put that into your, into your specification. Um, just very quickly, just some examples here. When you're promising, for example, therapeutic efficacy, again, you try to put in as much of your data as possible, the in vivo data, in vitro data as well, if you're promising a treatment of a chronic condition, I'll touch on this one case very, very quickly in a second. Um, again, it's going to require some long-term study. If it's a chronic condition, you're treating a something chronic, if you have a, a study that only lasts for a week or two weeks or a month, it may not necessarily be deemed sufficient to warrant a treatment for a chronic condition. 
Um, selection patents, I'm almost done. Selection patents, uh, again, as we know, it's directed to a species of a known genus. Could be one, could be many of the, uh, of the species. Um, again, these are patentable, but again, they have to meet certain criteria. Um, uh, for example, in, in Canada, one of the, we have a Supreme Court decision that, uh, that, that stipulates that in a selection, all members must have some advantage or overcome some disadvantage. So it's got to have some special feature over the other members of the genus. And all the members of that species must have that feature. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean therapeutic efficacy. For, for example, bio increased bioavailability would also be considered a special feature. Uh, as I mentioned here, if you compare that with the 3D issue uh, from, uh, that was uh, mentioned earlier today in the uh, talk with respect to India, uh, there's, a, there's a, obviously a difference there. Again, strategy here, clearly define in the disclosure what your promise is again. Uh, so the promise of, your, of your, your selection, that is, sorry. So again, what is your selection? What is that feature? What is the advantage that your selection is offering? Define that and then back it up with the proper disclosure to support that promise. Now, I'm not going to read all this. Uh, this is, this, if you want these slides, please let me know. Um, these, this is just a, uh, a, a, a two tables that just summarize some of the recent decisions from our courts, both the appeal court and the, uh, the lower federal court level, where patents have been found invalid for either lack of utility, or mainly lack of utility, and or lack of sufficiency of uh, disclosure. Um, the one I was going to mention very quickly was uh, the second down, the Automoxetine, uh, decision. Uh, this is Lily Viteva. Um, this was a treatment for ADHD. <clears throat> and I mentioned the chronic condition issue, and this is very quickly what I want to touch on. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, invention related to a compound that was treating ADHD. The, the court interpreted the promise of the patent to be just that, treatment of ADHD, but interpreted ADHD as a chronic condition. This is not a cure for ADHD. It's, it's a a treatment for controlling the effects of ADHD. So the way the court interpreted it was if you are providing a drug that's treating a particular condition on a long-term basis, there's got to be evidence of that. So have you demonstrated that it, it, that it's, uh, uh, it has efficacy you know, over a long term? No, there was no evidence of that sort. Do you have then the, the, the backup for the sound prediction that it would be usable uh, over a long term? That too wasn't contained in the specification, so that patent was found uh, invalid. Uh, the, the next one down uh, with respect to the uh, treatment of glaucoma, same issue there again. So again, I'm not going to go through all these, um, but certainly more than going to give you the slides if you want to take a look at them. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you.